But it's about everything in life should be an outflow of your intimacy, your walk in the reality of knowing him. So you can know, you can memorize the whole Bible. That doesn't do you any good. You have to know him or it's just words because he himself is the living word. Otherwise, it's just a book. Now we lift up the word of God and we believe this is the word of God, but the reality of it is Jesus Christ is the living word. And without him, these are just principles that work and they're good, but it has to be with him. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to give brownie points to Kurt Opel on the front row because he said my name when he said good morning. Thank you. That felt more personal. I will not try to say all of your names. Uh, So I'm up here. This is round two, but same service. My heart is beating. And say thank God because otherwise I would be dead. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, It's an honor to have this opportunity. Uh, This is my first time doing the solo in the the main service kind of deal. So it's an honor to be here. I'm glad to be here with you all. I mean, I'm always here, but I'm here, here, here. (laughs) Did that make sense? Okay. All right, so this is the part two of the series, The Power of Connection. Last week, we... uh, I don't know if it had like a technical title beyond the power of connection, but it was really about you as an individual learning how to connect with people, the importance of it, and just that kind of stuff. That's as much as I can remember, Uh, off the top of my head anyway. Uh, So this week, part two is the power of connection, intimacy, through intimacy with God. So we're going to be talking about intimacy, which to some is a wild, scary word, And so we're going to make it even more scary for you today. All right. Could you guys stand with me? And this is how we're going to start. We're talking about intimacy. We're going to go on a little journey. But we're going to start with connecting with the heart of God before we go anywhere else. And also, I just want to say, Bobby, that was so dangerous because... Whenever we do shouting stuff, I just want to, like, let loose, and so I did a little, but, like, I'm like, I have to talk after this. (laughs) That was powerful, though. Uh, All right, so let's just turn your attention to him, and I'm just going to talk about the Lord for a minute, and I want you, just however you want to do it, just lift up his name. Like, you could do it softly. I'm not saying, like, be loud and all that, but just turn your attention to him and just begin to worship him. So this Jesus that I know is the most wonderful. He is lovely. When he shows up, when his presence comes and fills the room that you are in, when he rests upon you, there is nothing else that can take that place. There is nothing else that is worth stepping away from that moment. He is wonderful. Jesus is the kindest, gentlest, most powerful person that I have ever seen. When you look into his eyes and you see those fires, it is the most deep well of love and passion. He is not passive and apathetic about his love for you. His his love for his church, his love for the world. He is passionate. And when there's those moments where maybe you're hurting or Uh, You're in a hard spot of life, and he knows how to come near in just the right way. He is so wonderful. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3, says his presence releases a fragrance so pleasing 
over and over poured out. His name is lovely, like flowing oil. No wonder the brides to be adore him. When you see his face, when you encounter his presence, there is no wonder why he is so adored. He is beautiful. He is wonderful. Jesus, you are wonderful. Just begin to speak to him now. Jesus, you are wonderful. We honor you in this place. Lord, there is nobody like you, and we want to see your glory. We want to see your face. God, we want our lives to be filled with your manifest presence, not just the idea of you, but the reality of you and who you are in our everyday life. Lord, we want to know you. There is nobody like you. Your eyes like fire. Pure, faithful. You are trustworthy. You are passionate. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. So if you were paying attention, you don't have to listen to anything else I say about intimacy because that was it. That was an introduction to what it is to have intimacy with the Lord. So what is intimacy? This is a simple, like this isn't like a Webster's Dictionary definition, but this is just how I like to explain it, and it's the simplest thing. But yet, it's so easy for us to miss it in the, I guess you could say, the ritual or the religion of just doing life day by day. Intimacy is the reality of knowing him. Not the idea of knowing him. It is the reality of knowing him. It is not a list of facts. Hopefully you agree, knowing the Word of God is good. Yes. Studying the Word of God is good. Yes. Praying and saying the right things is good. If you don't know that, now you do. <laughs> These things are good. Worshiping, all that stuff, singing songs, good. Doing what he's given you to do in life, great. That's awesome. We should do those things. The main thing is the reality of knowing him. Not simply knowing the right stuff and doing the right stuff. You can do all the do's and don't all the don'ts. That is fine. But that should come as a, as a result, as an outflow, as a byproduct of the reality of knowing him. Because when it's a real thing and you know him, now we all have growth. It, it's like a, we're all at a different place in our walk with the Lord. We don't measure a baby in Christ's level of maturity against someone who's been walking with the Lord for 30, 40, 50 years. So everyone's at their own place and on their own journey with him. So it's not about that, but it's about everything in life should be an outflow of your intimacy, your walk in the reality of knowing him. So you can, know, you can memorize the whole Bible. That doesn't do you any good. You have to know him or it's just words because he himself is the living word. Otherwise, it's just a book. Now, we lift up the word of God and we believe this is the word of God, but the reality of it is Jesus Christ is the living word. And without him, these are just principles that work and they're good, but it has to be with him. So this is intimacy. It's the reality of knowing him. A good way to know if you're moving in the right direction. How many uh, have a job? How many uh, are married? Who has kids? Who has family? Good. All right, more hands. Good. <laughs> Who knows somebody? Okay. 
life is filled with stuff, responsibilities, people, things that are necessary that you cannot give up. Like at some level you have to make money unless you're like living in the woods off the grid and you're one of those people, which more power to you, but whatever. If you have children, you cannot neglect the responsibility to, to raise and take care of your children. If you have a spouse, you cannot neglect the necessity of staying deeply and intimately connected to your spouse. That is a necessity. That is a necessary thing. But a, a way you know you're moving in the right direction is when all of the normal things, whether they're the wants of life or the needs of life, you know you're moving in the right direction when it comes to intimacy with the Lord. When his presence is not the distraction or doing things like reading the word or spending time in prayer is not a distraction. It's the main thing. Then all the other things take their place. And then you know you're moving in maturity when you can stay in like the core of his presence. And I believe me, I'm not here yet in a lot of ways. Uh, I, have a lot, I have a number of young children at home and it gets really loud sometimes and there's lots of emotions and just life. It's hard to do this. But you know you're maturing in intimacy with the Lord when you can do all of the necessities of life and stay connected in that deep place with the Lord. So this is the intimacy that we want to talk about, the power of connection. Because this is actually the foundation of who we are and how we are to walk in the Lord. Without that, we're just doing stuff. The Christian walk, the Christian life, is meant to be an experience. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you guys know that verse? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Not hear about and think that the Lord is good. Not, not hope that the Lord is good. We are to be a people of experience. That means that we are continually experiencing the reality of him, not the idea that there's a God in heaven, the reality of him. Do you guys know that you can know him? Like I could know my wife right here. Like I could know my brother-in-law, Javin. I just introduced him to you. This is my brother-in-law, Javin. <laughs> I could, you can know the Lord just like you can know the person sitting right next to you. He is not something to wait on that hopefully when you die and go to heaven that you get to meet him. We are called to know him and to experience him so that as the body of Christ, everything we do in the world, people are experiencing him. That is the goal of who we are. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, first service, this uh, wonderful woman, Sue, who laughs and sometimes snorts. She snorted, and she's not here for this service, so I had to fill in. Uh, all right, so some of you, as we talk about this intimacy thing, you don't know how to, like, get there on your own. Maybe you've not experienced him to that level where like you know him in that deep and secret place and that's okay. The good news is this. We are not supposed to do all of this stuff alone. We as the body of Christ are supposed to be connected together so that wherever you are weak or somewhere you want to grow, you are connected with people who can help bring you there. So here's just a plug for a couple things. If you don't know how to connect in prayer, because that's a big thing for people. They think prayer is just like giving God a list. Prayer is a conversation with the Lord and speaking out what he is saying in agreement with him and a lot of other things, but that's kind of the core of prayer, really. If you don't know how to connect in prayer, I know it was kind of mentioned, I think, uh, in some of the announcements, we have Monday nights at 6 o'clock. There's the prayer room that uh, Kat, who is just leading, uh, Catherine, and then John, they lead that. It's a time, it's a two-hour block of just leaning into the heart of God and being in that space of prayer. If you don't know how to connect that way, connect with a group that is doing it. If you don't know how to enter into worship in a deep and powerful way beyond just we're singing songs, encounter nights. 
Encounter Night School of the Holy Spirit, first and third Wednesday. We give the whole hour and sometimes a little longer if something's happening. Just being in his presence and seeing what he wants to do and worshiping him without trying to get anywhere. It's just worship. So if you don't know how to do this, you're not actually supposed to do this alone. We are supposed to be together learning and growing. And if you need help, connect with people who, who have what you want. Okay? Good. Moving on. All right, so what does it look like? What does the process of intimacy look like? Scripturally, let's read 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Many of you are probably familiar with this verse. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now here's the intimacy part. Because you have the spirit of the Lord. If you've made Jesus Lord, his spirit lives in you. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass or mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Real intimacy is not you trying to grow and do better. Real intimacy is face-to-face with him being transformed from glory to glory that is within you because he has placed his presence in you. So you being transformed in his glory face-to-face. That verse in 2 Corinthians is a great example of what walking in intimacy with the Lord will look like. Amen? Okay. Okay. So intimacy is the foundation, and now we're going to move on, and you might wonder why I'm going in this direction. Don't worry about it. The next part is sonship. We're going to talk about sonship. Intimacy is the foundation. Sonship is the next piece. Romans 12, verse 3, if you're following along. It will be up on the screen. should be. This is Paul talking. He says, For I say... Through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's a good verse. I'm going to maybe ruffle a few people, though. Are you ready? Much of the body has used that verse to have this perverted, messed up, and I'll just call it evil sense of what humility looks like. It is not humility. The flip side of that verse and what it actually is telling you to do, think of yourself as highly as you ought to think. Just don't think higher than that. What does that mean? That means, I'll give you an example. Someone gives you a compliment, like, Bobby, that transition was powerful, like you just stepped into the presence of God and like, release glory in the room. It was powerful. So I just gave Bobby a compliment. Here's an example of that crappy false humility. She could say like, oh no, it was just the Lord, all, all glory to God. What is that doing? That is a person, and I guarantee probably almost every one of you have done this at some level. Is it wrong to give God glory? No, that's not the point. The point is this, who are you? Are you a son or daughter? If someone gives you a compliment because you stepped out in something or you did something well or whatever, like doesn't matter what it is. If you can't receive that, just receive it without making yourself smaller. Here's a clue. God is not worried about you being big because he is big. That was good. All right. He doesn't have self-confidence issues. You can be big and not worry about overstepping who he created you to be. Pride is this. If you think you did it because you're all that and nothing else, that's pride. Real humility is recognizing that you are awesome, but it's because he made you awesome. Psalm 8 says this. This is David talking. He says, For you made man a little lower than the angels. And then he says this, That you've crowned him with glory 
and honor. He has crowned you with his glory and honor. It is not pride to accept a compliment. This church has been building and is building a prophetic culture. A prophetic culture by its very nature is to encourage, to fill up, and to build up by the word of the Lord and what the Spirit is saying. You should be so encouraged that you think you're amazing. I said this in the first service. This is an area, there are areas I struggle with. I am not like this perfect, all-powerful being because I'm not the Lord. But this is one area I don't struggle with that I can say confidently. I don't mind people complimenting me. Like, I can just say thank you. Like, I received that. Like, because the fact is, is as a son of God, he has given me stuff to do. I know it's him and me, but I've said yes and stepped out in it. And so I have no problem receiving a compliment. And you should not. I actually, here might, this might make some of you uncomfortable. When I think of what God's given me to do and the, the joy of the stuff that me and my wife have stepped out in together, I mean, I think this about her too, but like, I think I'm actually pretty stinking awesome. And here's the thing. Even if no one else in this room thinks I'm anything, I still think I'm pretty awesome. Because I've experienced his presence, because I've walked out in his power, I've seen how he moves through my yes to him. And so here's the thing. God doesn't do anything apart from his body. So you are allowed to be like excited that you're awesome and not think that it's prideful like you're stealing God's glory. The only example in the Bible we have of someone stealing his glory was a non-believer. That was Herod in Acts. And that's when he started speaking and they started, the people started shouting his praises saying, he's a God, not a man. And then it says an angel struck him down in that moment because he did not give God glory. He was an unbeliever. He was persecuting the church. This is not an example of the body of Christ stealing the glory of God. Okay. So what we see when we're not walking in awesomeness is this desire, apparently, for the body of Christ to walk in chronic discouragement. Does that sound like what sons and daughters should be walking in? Here's another thing. God is not trying to get rid of you. He's not trying to get you out of the way. So here's, and I'll ruffle more people probably with this. Stop praying John the Baptist prayers. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? John the Baptist said this. First of all, it wasn't a prayer. He said this. He said that I might decrease so that he may increase. That sounds wonderful. First of all, not a prayer. Second, John the Baptist was this Old Testament prophet who was the bridge for Jesus into the New Testament. John the Baptist, when he came on the scene, it was like revival broke out in Israel. It was powerful. It was wild. And he was a wild man. So everyone kept coming to him saying, are you him? Why did they ask that? Because all of Israel knew of this promised king, this Messiah coming. They thought it was John the Baptist. So John the Baptist said, no, it's not me. I point to another who is now here. That's not exactly how he said it, but that's the gist. John the Baptist recognized that his ministry was ending. Jesus's was beginning because he was the bridge. So when he said that I might decrease, revival broke out, but he had people know that this is ending because this is pointing to something that's coming and something better. You are not John the Baptist. You are not in the Old Testament. You are a son and daughter. You are the body of Christ. So if Jesus' ministry has increased because he has started, his ministry hasn't ended, he came and, and died and rose again and did what he came to do on earth, but the ministry of Jesus, the gospel, has not ended. You are the body of Christ, so there is no decreasing for the body of Christ. So no more John the Baptist prayers. Can you just commit to that? No more John the Baptist prayers. If you disagree with me, Feel free to disagree with me. I am right, though. 
just get to know the Lord. <laughs> but that's so common. We have this thought like we just need to make ourselves lower and smaller with this idea that humility is being low and small. Now, sometimes humility looks like serving and coming under someone, and it means not thinking of yourself too highly, but you should think of yourself as highly as you ought, because you are actually awesome. The Spirit of God that resided in the Holy of Holies that now has made you his living temple is not interested in smallness, littleness, and weakness. Now, in your weakness, he is strong. So it's not that you're doing stuff in your own power, but he did not make you to live and walk this weak, like fake, r ridiculous, humble life. It's, it's stupid. Don't do that fake humility. Fake humility does no one any good. In fact, it's actually pretty destructive. So the opposite of sonship is to be an orphan. So here's the good news for anyone who doesn't understand sonship. Maybe, and we all have this at varying degrees. Uh, the process of growing in the Lord is essentially like, you know, when you've come from death into life, the process is learning how to think where you thought like an orphan to now think like a son. That is kind of the process of renewal that we go through. So we all have varying degrees of orphan thinking. That just, it is true. So don't be condemned or like, I mean, you can be convicted. Don't be condemned by any kind of orphan thoughts that you might recognize. But he has not called you an orphan. He has not rejected you. You are not an orphan in his kingdom. So here's your permission. Stop being one. Stop being an orphan. Romans 8. I'm just going to read verse 19. But uh, I would encourage you, if you do some, like, deeper studying, uh, the reference would be Romans 8, verse 18 through 22. I'm going to read just verse 19 for the sake of time. It says this, For the earnest expectation, or it could say, for the anxious longing of the creature, so all of creation, waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. You, as a son or daughter, well, let me say it like this. All of creation, and this is after Jesus died and rose again. So this isn't talking about all of creation groaning for Jesus to come and die. This is talking about sons and daughters actually walking in the fullness of who he's created them to be. You have a choice to make. Nothing else is holding you back except how you're thinking and what you believe. And then the choices that you make that come from that. So you have a choice to continue thinking like an orphan every time you're faced with that or to choose sonship. Orphan thinking looks a lot like someone making decisions because they're afraid of punishment or rejection. It looks like someone who's trying to perform for acceptance, stuff like that. It's someone who doesn't know that they belong somewhere. An example of an orphan is someone who comes to church here, gets offended by one thing the leader says, and then just leaves. That's orphan thinking. And that's not condemnation on anyone who's even done that in this room, potentially. The reality is, you are called as a son or daughter, and the Lord would have you connect to the body outside of the thinking of an orphan. That you would be connected as a son or a daughter so that you can walk in the fullness that he's given you to walk in. And you cannot do that when you're by yourself. You cannot do that when you're by yourself. So here's a quick plug, and then that leads me to the last bit. Uh, the, the area of dealing with orphan thinking, not that we call it this a lot, but we have uh, in our transformation ministry, we have what we call a prism session. And a lot of what we end up dealing with is really orphan thinking stuff. So if you find that you struggle with that or you just want more of I don't know, help, I guess. Uh, set up a session. Uh, you can call the office and all that. Set up a session for a prism. And that is awesome. We've seen a lot of people get powerful freedom and healing through that. Amen. So it is a process, though. 
It's not just something that you flick a switch and you go from orphanhood to sonship. It's a reality of the renewing of your mind, what you believe and what you think. All right, so the last piece. This is actually what I'm most excited about. All of this was just leading up to this. Are you guys ready? Yes. Kurt has a seatbelt on. Extra brownie points. <laughs> Nah, I'm just being a silly goose. Okay, honor. Honor. So the foundation is intimacy. The next level from intimacy, because when you have intimacy with the Lord, that is where you discover the truth of who you are. Then nothing is built on uh, pretense or you just pretending that you know the right stuff so you do the right things. When you're in a place of intimacy, you know who you are because you see him and you know him. So then you have sonship, and then you're faced with orphan thinking or sonship. Choose sonship. Then you have honor. All of this connects. Something everyone should have, and if you don't know this, here's news for you. Something everyone should have is a dream and a vision for their life. Because you have purpose. What you do should not be and if this is you right now, just change. Make a decision to change. You are not supposed to just live day to day, do your job, hopefully pay your bills, and then die. But do you know how many people do that? That is so normal, and it's ridiculous, and it ought not be a part of the body of Christ because you have purpose. So you should have a dream and a vision. So the question would be, what has God given you to do? And that's not like, a, what's the one thing? Because there can be a lot of things, and it can change over time. But the question is, what has God given you to do? But now here's the flip side of that. This is how we're getting into honor. It's less about your dream and what you do than it is who you place yourself under to serve. It's less about what you do, and it's less about your dream than who you submit to to serve. In the body of Christ, and I've been guilty of this, in the body of Christ, we have a widespread thing of everyone just starting from ground zero over and over and over again. Why? Because generation after generation, we don't honor Elders, stop complaining. Oof, I didn't do this at nine. <laughs> the world is wild. We know this. Stop complaining about it. Because the young ones coming up hear that. What are the victories that God has done in your life? What is the breakthrough? Because that's what we want to hear. Stop complaining about who's president. Stop complaining about the junk you might see in the body of Christ right now. What has God done? What is he doing? Lead us. Young ones, I'll count myself a young one. <laughs> if you know, I'm 33, so I'm in like the best year that you could ever be because that was, you know, Jesus' death year. So, young ones, serve, honor. It doesn't matter if you agree with the person, it doesn't matter if they see your vision or accept your dream. If you honor what has come before, not only will you be in the alignment of the anointing and have authority to actually do what you want to do, if you honor and place yourself under the man or woman of God that he has put you under, or it could even be like the church, the, like if you're called to grace, that you submit and stay here even if you disagree, even if you're offended, 
not only will you be in the flow of the anointing the way he's designed it to be, I know I got it. <laughs> Just figuring out how I want to say it. <laughs> you will actually gain access to what has gone before. Honor gives you access. We've talked about the ancient wells a lot over the last couple of years, and so some of you have heard a lot about this. The ancient wells are the history, the legacy, and the generations before of people that have sacrificed and made a way because they said yes. So there are people in this room that you have seen breakthrough and increase in your life because you have placed yourself under the leaders of this house, which is my dad and mom. Because of their yes, you have experienced breakthrough that otherwise you may not have. And that's not to say that God wouldn't still work in your life if you weren't here. Of course he would. But there is a measure of increase, so here's really what I'm getting to with that, is we have the cycle of starting over because generation after generation rejects the, the elder generation because we don't want to accept the flaws that we see. Because the reality is every generation has flaws because we're all growing. We reject the flaws and walk away and do it on our own, and so by the repercussion of that is we also reject the victory and the breakthrough. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be okay with the flaws you see, but it is not up to you to be, it's not up to you and me, to be the corrector of the flaws. Can you honor and submit under the leader that God has given you? If the church understands honor and starts walking in that, you will see that increase of sonship. Did I? Yes, I'm, I didn't miss that. You will see the increase of sonship. You will see an increase of power and authority. The power and authority that some of you have dreamed of walking in, in the move of the Spirit, is only missing because you have yet to place yourself under someone and submit to their leadership. <laughs> Honor. Honor. So Paul says this. And here's just the other natural side. Regardless of your parent's situation, Honor your father and mother. The Bible is very clear about that. You will only be able to honor God to the level that you honor the leader he has placed in your life. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16. And I'm, I'm wrapping up soon. All right, fine. I'm not wrapping up anytime soon then. All right, I got permission. All right, verse 15, chapter 4. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, this is Paul talking, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be you followers of me. Now, what is he saying? You can be taught, you can feed on all the stuff you want to. But you are not a church unto yourself. Follow the one who begot you. You have one father. You can have all the teachers you want. You have one father. And this isn't specifically talking about our father in heaven, because yes, that's true too. But he's talking about, here's, here's the point. We have, and this is kind of probably an American problem, we have such an issue with authority. Do you know that it's not your call? When you submit to authority and they're wrong, you don't have permission to stop submitting. And that's so hard for us. But until we learn that, now, that does not mean that you should stay in an abusive situation of authority. There are people that abuse it, but just because they might be wrong and encourage you to do something that you don't think is right, now I'm not talking about moral things, but like they may have made a wrong decision in leadership, that is not permission to, to break relationship and stop submitting. It's really not. 
As soon as you do that, you are going back to ground zero, and all the momentum and potential increase that you could be experiencing in the body, and the body as a whole, you are putting a halt to it, bit by bit by bit. And so all the stuff where we talk about revival, and we want to see these things happen, it's not going to happen just because we pray more. Prayer either works or it doesn't. So if we're speaking something out because he is showing us and he has shown us, the body of Christ at large has been speaking to this move of God that is coming and is now happening. We're seeing trickles of it here and there. We will not see the fullness until we actually grab a hold of the sonship and honor thing from the foundation of intimacy with the Lord. It's not about submitting because you're a lowly servant because that's not who you are. Submission is knowing who you are and saying, I see the leader that, so my leader, my spiritual father also happens to be my actual father. So in this example, just know that there, he's both of them. <laughs> That's not true for everybody. For me, my dad is the one who God has given me to submit under. That means that even if I see, let's say I see everything going on in grace and I'm like, I know how to fix this. I know how to see breakthrough in this, all this stuff, yada, yada. And I know what God wants to do. And I submit that to my dad, and he disagrees with me, then it's not happening. And if I try to overstep that, or if I split and do my own thing, the favor of God will not be on that. Yeah. If you want his favor, you want to see the increase, find who God has placed you to submit to and stay there. So some of you... Some of you are here because you did that at your previous church. Ask the Lord. I'm not his Holy Spirit for you. You might need to go back and mend that relationship. You might need to bite the bullet and mend things. Some of you have been called here. Some of you have no idea. Some of you have been called here. If he has called you here, set your roots down. The power of connection is the body of Christ walking in unity. If we get the honor thing, we will see the unity that everybody talks about. If we learn how to walk in honor, then the churches in our region will see that in some way, shape, or form, and we will see unity even across denominations and stuff and all that kind of thing. The stuff that people have prayed into and spoken and had vision for, the body of Christ even regionally being unified in its love and, and movement of what the Holy Spirit is directing us to do. Do you want that? It's unconvincing. You have a choice to make. You can either choose to stay an orphan and stay on the outskirts of everything that's happening and never eat of the richness of the fruit of what's being birthed in the spirit. So you can stay on the outside. You have that choice. The Lord still loves you. Or do you want to walk in sonship? Do you want to experience the anointing and the power and the glory, truly, that comes from the alignment of being submitted to authority? Because you will never walk in authority. You will never walk in a greater authority than what you can just do on your own if you don't submit. Okay, we're wrapping up. I'm closing. So the last question is, where has God placed you? Could you guys stand with me? Where has God placed you? You have to know him. You have to choose sonship. Every time you're faced with a opportunity to choose one way or the other and you need to choose honor this is how we will see the body walk as the body every joint in its place supplying what he has given you to supply so I just want to bless you guys so if you want to receive what we're talking about just be in a posture of receiving whatever that looks like 
God, I ask for increase of encounter, face-to-face -face encounter. I release that over each and every one of these, that they would know you face-to-face. -face. And if they already know you, take them deeper, Lord. Take them deeper. And Lord, if they have not stepped over that line into that place of a deep re reality of knowing you, Lord, even bring people across their path that have what they want. Bring them together. So I ask for increase of encounter. Lord, show us your glory. We want to see your face. We want to walk in the power, the authority, and the love, and in the unity of the body that you have created us for. Lord, reveal to them how awesome they are, how you see them. God, give us a revelation of sonship. Give us revelation of honor. So right now, I release honor in this room. I release honor to have access to the generations that have gone before, the sacrifices that they have made, the breakthrough that they have in the Lord. That we would have access to the legacy stemming all the way back to Abraham when he said yes. I release honor and I release courage right now. I release courage over you. That you would have the courage to step out into true humility of knowing who you are in a place of honor and sonship under the place and person and leader that God has placed you under. I release courage to step out. I release courage to be who you were created to be without apology, but in the reality of knowing him, knowing who you are. In Jesus' name. Now keep your eyes closed. If you, well, if you need to know Jesus, if you need to make him Lord, or if you have maybe walked away and you don't know him like what you're hearing today, maybe what you saw during that worship time, if you don't know him but you want to, the good news is that he has forgiven you completely, that he has invited you from death into life by his blood, because Jesus came, he died, and then he rose again for you so that you would be restored into your rightful place as a son or daughter of God. But you have to say yes. You have to choose him as Lord. This is the first step of submission, meaning that you can't do it on your own. He did it for you, and you have to say yes to that. So if you need to make Jesus Lord, or if you want to rededicate your life, can you raise your hand? Just raise your hand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm not worried about seeing all the hands. There's a few of you at least. So let's just pray. And then before I pray, I want to encourage you to come up to the freedom team after because you need, and I'm saying need, I'm not, it's not a maybe, it's a need. You need to connect with someone face to face and share that you made a decision to make Jesus Lord or to rededicate your life. So let's pray. You can all pray after me. Say, Jesus. You are Lord. I confess you as Lord. I thank you for your blood. I thank you for your forgiveness. Jesus, be my Lord. I am yours. You are mine. And I receive you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you guys just give a hand for everyone who made that decision? Thank you. God is